Now, Roma Wines, R-O-M-A, made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. Roma Wines present Suspense. Tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Gregory Peck as star of The Lonely Road, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness in entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Gregory Peck in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Thanks, Doc. Well, hello, Gare. How goes it? Oh, not bad. You want a statement, I suppose. Mm-hmm, that's right. Well, tell me first, is, is she apt to get the extreme penalty? Well, that'll depend a lot upon what you have to say. I see. Well, I'll, I'll give it to you straight. I'm counting on you to do your best for her. Oh, sure, sure. Now, go ahead, shoot. Okay. The first time I saw Jenny, she was coming along the road carrying a suitcase. I knew she was headed for our place because it's the only house for miles around there. I was trimming the hedge, and I'd got as far as the rear gate when she reached it. I waited for her to speak. Is this the Gare place? That's right. What can I do for you? You had an ad in the paper for a girl to do general housework. Oh, yes, of course. Well, come along into the house. My wife will want to have a talk with you. This is a beautiful place you've got here, Mr. Gare. But it's certainly hard to get to. You've walked from the highway? Yeah. Must have been almost five miles. The sun is something fierce. I almost gave up. Don't any buses run along here? <laughs> no, we're pretty isolated. But when there's help in the house, I always manage to give them a lift into town. <laughs> that makes it nice, Mr. Gare. What's your name? Jenny. Jenny what? Jenny will do. All right, Jenny, in here, please. And uh, Mrs. Gear's a trifle hard of hearing, so you'll have to speak up a bit. Oh, Helen, this is Jenny. She's come in answer to our advertisement. Oh, yes. I'm very glad to see you, Jenny. Won't you sit down? She was extraordinarily looking. Not beautiful or pretty. Striking, I guess, would be the word. She had heavy black braids wound about her head. Her eyes were a clear green and looked straight through you. And she was lean and powerful, like a young animal, a leopard or a panther or something. While my wife engaged Jenny, that night she cooked an excellent dinner and served it well. She had on a purple skirt and a cerise, I guess you'd call it, blouse, and I could see Helen eye it with disfavor. Every time the girl came close to me, I... I could feel the strength of her. And those green eyes watched us as if she was sizing us up. We took our coffee and cigarettes out on the veranda after dinner. You can look right over the orange grove to the hills. It's nice. Steve, what do you think about Jenny? Hmm? Oh, well, it's a little early to judge. Seems capable enough. That was a darn good dinner, if you ask me. Maybe we're in luck, darling. Maybe. What is she, do you think? Mexican? No, oh, I'd say Slavic with that build and shape of face... A little more coffee, Helen. Half a cup. Mm, you're probably right. <laughs> There's a, a sort of, oh, gypsy arrogance, boldness about her that makes me well, uneasy, as if I'd have something to cope with. We went up to bed early. I was pretty exhausted every night with all the physical work I had to do. I turned out the light and for some reason stepped over to the window. Jenny's room was downstairs on the same side of the house as ours in the rear. Her light was still on. She was getting ready for bed, and her shadow, huge and black, lay across the lawn. Her arms were raised to take down those heavy braids. There was something actually classic about the thing. 
The picture of it stayed in my mind long after I'd got into bed. Well, two or three days went by, and... And Jenny... Well, the thing was, you were conscious of her all the time. Wherever she was about the house, whatever she was doing, you thought about her. I was working in the garage one afternoon when she came out there with the butcher knife. Mrs. Gare says you have a whetstone out here. Could I get you to sharpen my knife for me, Mr. Gare? Of course. Just a moment. What's that you're doing? Oh, I'm trying to mend this old bear trap. Oh, are you a trapper, Mr. Gare? <laughs> oh, no. Hardly. There's a coyote around that's been stealing the chickens. I'm hoping to catch him. There. Now then, let's have the knife. What do you do, Mr. Gare? Well, Jenny, Mrs. Gare was a concert pianist at the time of our marriage. I was a manager. Now I take care of her properties. Holdings, investments, you know. You mean you sign things for her, like checks and papers and things? Power of attorney, yes, that's part of it. Hmm. Pretty soft for you, huh, Mr. Gare? <laughs> On the contrary, it's quite a job. Keeps me busy. I still say you've got a pretty setup. And she didn't get such a bad deal herself. She's crazy in love with you. Anybody can see that. Why not? You're good looking, Mr. Gare. And uh, young. You must be at least, at least 12 years younger than she is. <clears throat> Now, here's your knife, Jenny. Careful now. It's like a razor. Thanks a lot. That's the way I want it. I can't stand a dull knife. So, uh, I'll probably bother you often. A few more days went by. I finished my trap and set it out near the chicken run, hoping I'd catch my thief. And one night after dinner, we were in the living room. What's the matter, Helen? Steve, it's that girl. She was standing there in the dining room door listening. Jenny? Well, she probably likes music. What's the harm? Oh, it isn't that. She's always listening and watching. It's beginning to get on my nerves. How about her work? Oh, well, she works hard enough. She's willing and clean as a pin, but... Well, I, I have a feeling she doesn't respect me, that I, that I just don't figure in her scheme of things. She's, she's just simply taken the place over. I don't even run my own house anymore. Well, fire her, why don't you? Oh, no, I couldn't. Say the word and I'll do it for no, you. No, no, I, I don't want you to. Steve, frankly, I'd be afraid to tell her to go. She she might get ugly and, and set fire to the house or something. Oh, I never heard such nonsense in my life. What ails you, Helen? Aren't you well? I'm just terribly nervous, Steve. It, maybe that's why she takes advantage. Well, that settled that. I felt like a heel, though, because... I was relieved that Helen didn't want to fire Jenny. I was obliged to admit to myself that the girl was getting under my skin. Any little service she had to perform for me, she made very special, standing as close as she dared. I could feel the magnetism of that strong, perfect body. Her hair smelled like new apples, and those clear green eyes would linger caressingly in mine. Then after about two weeks... One night, it must have been one or two o'clock. Steve. Steve, wake up. Mm. What's the matter? That girl. I think she's out there in the hallway. I, I think she's been in this room. Oh, Helen. I'm frightened, Steve. Please make a light. Oh, all right. No one around, Helen. You must have been dreaming, dear. Oh, Perhaps I was. I, I dream about her often, Steve. Horrid, confused kind of dreams. I'm trying to scream for help and can't. It's, it's oh, just... Good Lord, Helen. I never thought anybody could get you down. You've got to control yourself somehow. This is just plain silly. Yes. Yes. I turned out the light and got back into bed. In a little while... I could hear Helen's even breathing and knew she was asleep. I lay there, thinking about Jenny, of course. I never thought of much else. In a moment, I, I heard the piano. 
So faint, I thought I was imagining it. And it came again. Weird. Ghostly. I got up again, put on my robe, and slipped downstairs. The living room was dark except for the moonlight pouring through the window. And Jenny's figure, black against the light, was moving towards me. Almost before I knew it, she'd pressed close against me, crushing her mouth to mine. It was like being stung. Sharp, sweet, terrible. Jenny, what is this? <laughs> Don't kid me. You knew this was coming. That it had to come, that nothing could keep us apart. Now, everything's going to be all right. But... But, Jenny... We... We can't. Helen is no fool. We can't let her stand in our way. What... What do you mean? It won't be hard. Just a matter of figuring the best way. I don't know what you mean, Jenny. And we can't stay here talking like this any, any longer. I... It'll be just you and me, Steve. And all that money. Think what we can do with it. Just think. Are you crazy? Yeah. Crazy for you. Just like you are for me. Listen, Steve. Inside of five or six years, you're going to be stuck with a deaf old woman. What you going to do? Sit here and grow old with her? Not you. Sooner or later, you'll clear out. So why not now? With me. Why? It's not so simple as you make it sound, my dear. All you have to do is to spread around the town that Helen's going to visit her folks. Mississippi or someplace. And leave her to me. Afterwards, you can say your wife's decided to stay down south. That you're going, going to sell out and join her. Then we can turn everything into cash and we're on our way. Easy? The next few days I worked outside till my hands bled and my whole body shrieked with pain. To keep from thinking, I began having nightmares. I'd wake up in a cold sweat and lie there longing for daylight, swearing that as soon as morning came, I'd throw that girl out of the house. But she'd brush against me or touch my hand and I'd be wild for her again. I guess I knew then that sooner or later I'd agree to nearly anything she asked. For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Gregory Peck in The Lonely Road by Marion Orth. Roma Wine's presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Between the acts of Suspense, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Today is the first day of spring, a welcome time everywhere, but especially at Roma. For in Roma's carefully kept vineyards, located in California's choicest wine-growing districts, the precious vines are already stirring with renewed life. The eternal miracle of soil and sun is now creating the luscious goodness of tender grapes that Roma's master vintners patiently, unhurriedly, guide to tempting, mellow wine perfection for you. If you've never enjoyed fine Roma California wines... You'll be delighted to discover Roma can offer you so much taste luxury for so little. Yes, Roma is America's first choice in wine for every occasion, every day. Yet, you can enjoy fine Roma wine for just pennies a glass, about the cost of a soft drink. And all Roma wines are bottled at the winery to bring you sealed in, unvarying goodness always. So, for praise-winning hospitality or for happy family evenings at home, serve Roma Sherry, Port, Muscatel, or Tokay. Insist on Roma, R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Discover why more Americans enjoy Roma than any other wine. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Gregory Peck, who as Stephen Gare in The Lonely Road continues a narrative well calculated to keep you in suspense.
Helen began to get on my nerves. It seemed that every day she looked older, washed out, became deafer. I began to despise her, to want her out of my way, out of Jenny's in my way. One morning at breakfast, Jenny came in and stood there looking at me fixedly. Well, Jenny, what is it? If you're going to town today, Mr. Gare, I've written down some things for the house. Very well, Jenny. If your list's ready, give it to me. I'll be leaving in a few minutes. I knew what she meant. She was getting impatient. My reply, which she waited for with those green eyes fixed on mine, was virtually a consent to her plan. As for me, I, I wasn't sure what I meant to do, but I thought it would do no harm at least to set the ball rolling. In town, I dropped into the garage and asked the mechanic to look the car over. I said Mrs. Gare was planning a trip to visit her family in Mississippi, that I'd have to drive her into Tucson to take the train, and that my tires weren't so good. After that, I stopped at the realty office. Well, uh, really, Mr. Gare, you're thinking of selling that beautiful place of yours? Oh, it's just a possibility. I don't want any prospective buyers about the places yet, but my wife is planning a trip south, and I may follow her and remain there permanently. Help such a problem. A place of ours takes a lot of handling. A fellow gets sped up after a while. Well, there'd be no difficulty disposing of the property, Mr. Gare. Well, just let me know when you're ready. And meanwhile, I won't bother you with people coming. I drove home in a sort of trance. I wasn't shocked at what I'd done, and, and the thing was still wide open if I wanted to back out. When I got home, I, I didn't want to go into the house. So far, I'd had no luck with the coyotes, so I busied myself setting the trap in another spot. While I was doing this, Jenny came out with that butcher knife again, and we went into the garage. Helen was at the piano. Did you do what I told you to see? Yes. Good. I can't stand this much longer. Nor I, Jenny. But, but I... I can't bear to be here when... Kiss me, Steve. Don't worry. It'll be when you're out of the house. She didn't say any more, just, just looked at me with a twisted little smile. I gave her the sharpened knife, and she kissed me and went into the house. At dinner that night, Helen said... I had words with Jenny today, Steve. I can't have her around any longer. You can fire her tonight, if you will. What? Oh, oh no, my dear. I, I offered to do it once, and you wouldn't let me. Now you'll just have to do it yourself. Steve, I'm afraid of her terribly. Why, has she been ugly, threatening? Oh, don't shout so, Steve. I'm not as deaf as all that. And she'll hear you. No, no, she she hasn't threatened me, nothing like that. There's, there's just something about her that fills me with horror. Oh, you're imagining things, Helen. What, what possible reason could she have for harming you? I don't know, but this, this house has become a dreadful place. I'm... I'm cold all the time, and I'm shaky, and... And you seem different. You look at me sometimes as if you hate me. Now, see here, Don't Helen, try I... to reason with me. If she doesn't get out of this house quick, I'll lose my mind. She's like a witch or something malignant or evil. Jenny came in just then to change the plates for dessert. As she bent over to take the platter, she held that knife in her hand in such a way that my blood ran cold for a minute. After she'd gone out, you haven't noticed it, but lately I haven't taken a mouthful of food until I've seen you start to eat for fear she'll poison me. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Why shouldn't she poison me as well? Because she's crazy about you. Oh, for heaven's sake. And you're crazy about her. Don't deny it, Steve. I may be deaf, but I'm not blind, you know. Look, Helen... I'm going into town for a drive. If you want to fire Jenny while I'm gone, that's all right with me. I tried not to dwell on the immediate events, but, but to think about the time when I'd be free to go away with Jenny. The drive into town seemed endless, but at last I pulled up in front of the hotel. Come to 
the papers? Yes, and a cigar, maybe, Fred. I I looked around the little lobby. There wasn't a, wasn't a soul in there that I knew. I watched the people. One minute feeling sorry for them because their lives were so drab. The next, envying them because they were so secure, simple. And I, I was sitting there, staring unseeingly at the local paper, when I... I suddenly came out of this trance, or a spell that I'd been under. The shock of realization was frightful. I didn't want anything to happen to Helen. I prayed to heaven I'd get home in time. I kept recalling similar instances of such crimes I'd read in newspapers. I'd always wondered how people could become involved in such things. Well, I knew all about it now. Weak fool to let a coarse creature like that lead me into such a thing. If only I could be in time. I'd throw that girl out and devote the rest of my life to making Helen happy. Helen, generous, loving, intelligent, and talented. Why hadn't I thought of all this before? Then I saw the car. It was parked at the side of the highway right at my turnoff. I knew it was a police car. I cursed to myself and prayed. Don't let them take long. I've got to be in time for Helen. Please. An officer stepped out into the road and waved his flash. Please, I said to myself. Please. Hello. <laughs> What's up, officer? Oh, looking for a stolen car, but uh, not a baby like that one. <laughs> a local car, was it? Yeah. Hey, you better let me have a look at your operator's card, my friend. You must have been doing about 80 along that stretch. Oh, oh, sure. Here you are, officer. I, I, sorry I was overdoing it. I was just in town, and I, I guess I stayed longer than I intended. My wife's alone in the house and not very well, and well, I, I was in a hurry to get home. You uh, live down this road? Uh, that's right. Say, maybe that car could have got down in there. I think I'll... Uh... No, no, no. I, I, I mean, I, I would have seen it. Uh, okay, Mr. Gare, just uh, take it easy, will you? <laughs> Certainly will, officer, and thanks. Good night. I stood there in the doorway, looking up. There was a light upstairs in the window of our bedroom. It threw a radiance on the screen door and burned with a, a steady glow, as if, it, as if it had been burning like that for ages. As if it had witnessed a scene of horror and brooded over it, keeping the secret to itself. When I started finally for the house, my legs were so stiff I, I could scarcely walk. I stayed off the gravel, walking on the grass... And went in the back door. There wasn't a sound. I tiptoed through the kitchen, through the dining room, across the hall. Then I could see the light from that lamp spilling down the stairway at the far end of the dark living room. My heart thumped so loud I could hear it. I wanted to call out, but I didn't dare. Whom would I call? Perhaps everything was all right. Perhaps Helen was up there in bed. How I prayed she was. I hesitated on the threshold. Thought of glancing into Jenny's room, but... But that would have looked queer if... If nothing had happened. I stepped over the threshold. Ah! It was that trap. That bear trap. Somebody had placed it there, ready for me. Who? He was excruciating. I wrenched and pulled at the thing. Helen! Jenny! Somebody! Come and give me a hand. Oh! Oh. Who is it? Oh, help me. Help me hurry. I'm caught in this trap. Get the hammer, pliers, anything. Oh. Oh. She reached the bottom of the stairs and snapped on the lights. I've never seen such a sight in my life. There was blood all over the place. On the wallpaper, the white paint... Then I saw Jenny, 
lying on the floor in a crumpled heap, her long braids soaking in... Helen's dress. Her hands and face were spattered with it. Her hair was disheveled, her eyes like pinpoints of fire. And against her side, I could see the gleam of that long, sharp knife. She was coming slowly towards me. Oh, we were beautifully caught, Jenny and I. She with her knife, I with my trap. Helen, don't look like that. What's happened? You planned this together, you two. But it didn't turn out just as you thought it might. Helen, you please don't look at me like together. that. Well, there she is. Look at her. If I hadn't been ready for her, I'd be lying in her place and you'd be glad, wouldn't you, Steve? No, no. Helen. Helen, are you insane? Drop that knife, for heaven's sake, and listen to me. She came closer. I made a lunge for her. The grip of that steel about my legs threw me off balance and I fell forward. She sprang on me. I fought her off, but that knife came at me. Face, throat, everywhere like flashes of lightning. Helen, don't do this to me. I swear I came back. Ah! Helen, don't! No! Ah! Lieutenant, that police car arrived in time to save my life. But I... I wish they'd let her finish the job. Then and there. <laughs> okay, Gare. Okay, thanks. I'll, uh, I'll send the doc right in. And, Gare, I wouldn't worry too much about Helen. I think she'll be all right. Suspense Presented by Roma Wines R-O-M-A Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world Before we hear again from Gregory Peck the star of The Lonely Road, tonight's suspense play, this is Truman Bradley for Roma Wines. Here's how millions of American homemakers are relieving the monotony of meatless Lenten meals. They are adding zest and freshness to otherwise drab menus by serving a fine Roma table wine. Yes, Roma wine makes the difference between just eating and friendly, enjoyable dining. Try serving Roma California Sauterne with your favorite fish tomorrow. Discover how delicate, pale gold Roma Sauterne lends enchanting new charm and companionship to your table. How Roma's delightful fragrance and smooth, palatable goodness make dining more pleasurable. With baked beans or spaghetti, serve full-bodied red Roma California Burgundy. They're perfect flavor mates. Tomorrow, Friday, make dinner a treat with Roma wine. Roma wines cost but pennies a glass. So little, everyone can enjoy them often. Insist on Roma. R-O-M-A, Roma Wine. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is Gregory Peck. Like everyone else here in the film colony, I've always admired suspense, and it's been very exciting to appear here tonight. I want to thank Maria Palmer, who appeared as Jenny, and Kathy Lewis, who enacted the role of Helen in tonight's play. Next Thursday on Suspense, a very famous character of crime fiction will make his debut on the air. That'll be Baynard Kendrick's remarkable blind detective, Captain Duncan McLean. And Brian Donlevy will play Captain McLean in a radio play built around one of the most ingenious and cunning murders I've ever heard about. I'll surely be listening, and, and I know you will want to listen next Thursday to Suspense. Gregory Peck will soon be seen as star of The Yearling, produced by Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer. Next Thursday, same time, Roma Wines will bring you Mr. Brian Donlevy as star of Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrill. Produced by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. Suspense is broadcast from coast to coast and to our men and women of the armed forces overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the armed forces radio service. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.